All right, so welcome to our first lecture series. <clears throat> this week, we're asking ourselves, what is it that we're doing here in core humanities, ancient and medieval cultures? And really, when we drill right down to it, we've got two things that are on our plate, which is where do we start, right? Like how far back is the beginning of ancient and medieval cultures? And <clears throat> what is a human, right? So this is the humanities. So what is a human? So this first lecture series is going to be in three parts, human world making, how to human. And I do want to give a content warning. There are going to be some uh, surprise elements that are that can be um, <clears throat> can be troubling, particularly discussion of historical trauma and genocide. So please be aware and take whatever steps are necessary to take care of yourselves if that's something that's gonna make it difficult for you to get through the material. So first, a word. One of the things that we're gonna be dealing with this semester is how do we go from the stage of information, which there's a ton of, right? We have a ton, a ton, a ton of information in the world now. Um, and how do we take that information and translate it into knowledge? So that's a large part of what we're going to be deciphering this whole semester, right? One of the reasons that we are doing the course the way we're doing it is because when I sat down to try and figure out, okay, so what's the most important thing to convey to my students when I'm teaching ancient and medieval cultures? The answer that kept coming to me is that there is no important, like, you must know this content. You must know this book and this culture. Because, frankly, there's so much to know now, right? And a lot of what's traditionally taught in this course, which is a European history of ancient and medieval cultures, a lot of that dominates the stuff that we already know. And there's a whole world out there of stuff that we don't get taught on the regular. So what we're doing this semester is we're learning how to navigate the fact that there is so much more information than we could ever possibly deal with. So how do we navigate that and turn that into knowledge, something we can use, right? So we're gonna be learning the things that are traditional but we're going to be using that knowledge of the traditional content of a course like this to help us to also navigate unknown territory. And that's why our group work is going to take focus or is going to focus on, I should say, um, a culture that's not familiar to us. Right. And specifically a non-Western, non-European culture that's not a part of what's traditionally taught. taught. So you're still going to get that traditional knowledge. That's just going to come in the lecture content, and it's going to be an example of how these larger structures that most cultures experience work in this case. And then you're going to turn around and you're going to try and find similar information in the cultures that you're investigating for the semester and translate that into knowledge. And the last step here is that knowledge does not equal wisdom. So towards the end of the course, we're going to want to be thinking about questions like, what do we do with this knowledge? What's the point? And why have we gone through all of this effort to gain it? So that's our little disclaimer as an introduction to this course. Let's talk a little bit about contextualizing the human. Um, so a course like this usually begins with the dawn of civilization. So that's like 6,000 BCE or so. Um, but when you think about it, that's not very long ago. So this is called the cosmic calendar. And it's essentially if you were to take the entire history of the universe and collapse it down into a 12 month calendar, pretty much everything that we know um, <laughs> or that we think of as like the depths of time would all be happening in the last month of that one year. Right. So like from the beginning of time, the Big Bang, all the way up until multicellular life, <laughs> that all takes the majority of existence. And so everything that we know about the complicated history of this planet and life on it actually comes from this this last 12th of the calendar, right? And a good portion of that is occupied by dinosaurs. And then um, there's some evolutionary history. And then we start to get into like 
human evolution and then human migration. And in the last 60 seconds of this one year calendar is like all of human history. <laughs> All of it, <laughs> like everything that we know because humans have recorded it themselves. So when we talk about human human timescales, we're talking about a really, really tiny slice of the overall timescale. That's number one. And number two, when we talk about human history itself, the last 6,000 years is also a really, really tiny slice. So let's look at the beginnings of human history uh, through the evolutionary history of humanity, also known as Homo sapiens. Um, so here we are, we have the like family tree of the Homo sapiens. This has this is actually a really nice interactive exhibit. If you want to go visit it here at the human family tree, I will provide the slides. They are all accessible and you would be able to, in fact, visit the site that this comes from. Uh, so evolutionary history of humanity. One of the things that we know is Homo sapiens sapiens, that we are the most familiar version of humanity uh, to us. This, this is like the most recent evolutionary version of an upright humanoid on this planet, but it certainly was not the only one. Uh, we want to have a note of caution here about organizing knowledge into trees, right? When we do that with something like this, it implies two things. Like the first thing it implies is that everything on the tree, everything is related back to an origin, right? Um, <clears throat> and that's kind of the way a tree diagram works. And then the other thing is that the only possible set of relationships are between here and the center, right? Or here and then its center and then its center and then its center, right? And so it's, ex it's defined exclusively by a branch's point of origin, or what that means is where it branches off from the main family. And what it doesn't include is relationships in between the branches. It implies that like that's impossible, essentially. But what we know about human history is actually a lot more complicated than that, right? There are a bunch of different groups on this tree and some of them, you'll notice some of them split off in other places, but this diagram doesn't try to put every single one of these little uh, nodes on a distinct branch. They covered up, they're like, um, leaves. We're not going to articulate the exact branching relationship between these things because turns out it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, so we're familiar with the history of evolution as we learned it from Charles Darwin, right? Survival of the fittest in which a primitive pre-humanoid ape creature slowly over time becomes more evolved because they have adaptive mechanisms that select out the most survivable members of the group and therefore the group over time becomes fitter, right? Like. It's a kind of linear move, but that's not really how evolution works, right? We see a little bit of that with the, with the branching in this diagram, but it's not really so simple. So let's rewind to the Atlas of Human Evolution. So about 120,000 years ago. And what we find is that on at least three, and an important note here, at least three places uh, in the world, there were independently evolving hominid species, meaning like humanoid species, I guess I should say. Um, <clears throat> hominins, they're called. And what this means is that we're not all descended from a single ancestor. That's not how that worked. Um, and one of the things that's left out of this map is, of course, um, the Western Hemisphere. And I think it's going to be important for us to acknowledge that n knowing that humans can did did evolve independently in separate regions in Eurasia and Africa would suggest that it is possible that they evolved independently in the Western Hemisphere 
But as yet, that's not an established scientific theory. So we're just going to point out that that is clearly a possibility. Um, it is not even the going theory, but we're going to get into that with next week's readings as to like how we <laughs> um, how we get to that uh, science. So we're going to get there. And in fact, this week's reading, Charles, Charles Mann is going to get into that a little bit. Um, so ancient, 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 like way past ancient, deep human history, three different locations. And then you fast forward about 30,000 years. And what you start to see is that these groups are intersecting. And we know for sure that the Homo sapiens who occupied a lot of Africa and now um, <clears throat> the Arabian Peninsula, we know for sure that they interacted with and intermarried with Neanderthals who were occupying Europe, right? We know less about the interactions between Neanderthals and the Homo erectus or Denisovan people, but it's probable there was some interaction. We just don't see it here yet in this in this map. Um, the last thing that we want to highlight is that Homo sapiens liked to move, right? So not only did they have this large contact area here with the Neanderthals, they also moved across Southern Asia and they interacted largely with the Denisovan or Homo erectus folks um, who are over here in the Far East now. So if you remember, a lot of this area was already occupied by the Denisovan or Homo erectus peoples. And when the Homo sapiens move in, they don't necessarily just push out the predecessors, they actually intermarry. And we can actually see a lot of how this may have happened in modern human DNA, but I'm getting ahead of myself, we'll get there. Um, so that evolutionary history of humanity is not so nice and neat and clean, right? It's not this like simple tree, there's lots of intermarrying here and here. Um, so that diagram of survival of the fittest doesn't really fit. So here's our Homo sapiens. This probably represents Homo neanderthalus, but actually Homo neanderthalus was totally separate, right? Totally separate human, not a step in the process, as was Denisovan. These are now this is these are all reconstructions of what they may have looked like based on their surviving skulls, right? But artists have to make a lot of interpretive leaps in there. So we're gonna put an asterisk on this and we're gonna come back around to it. Um, so survival of the fittest, questionable. <clears throat> so recall that here we are. I, I nixed the last image of Homo sapiens because actually Homo sapiens would have looked a lot more like this guy here. And this, this is in fact, <laughs> an accurate reconstruction of Homo sapiens edulta. And, and this guy who hails from Africa probably looks pretty familiar, but we wanna make sure that we're clear that any projection of skin tone at this point is purely interpretive, right? We do not know that edulta was this black. We do not know that Homo neanderthalus was light-skinned. In fact, many different depictions range from light to dark skin, depending also on how dirty they depict Homo neanderthalus. And we do not know that this is, this is the skin tone of um, Homo erectus. I, I included some of these images, though, because they really help you to see that the differences between these hominins are not so large as we might be led to believe by a progressive diagram like the last one. Um, and for our viewing pleasure, this is a different paleo artist's rendering of the Denisovan or Homo erectus people. And notice that the different choice of skin tone and the application of head and facial hair can make the exact same reconstruction based on the same skeleton look very different. So we want to be mindful of what kinds of things our reconstructions are implying as we look at these projections of what a past hominin would have been like right um here's another one that i like just because it's super fun if you're if you know someone who's like european humans and homo sapiens are obviously the most advanced i just want to point out europeans are neanderthals 
like literally not as an insult europeans have much more neanderthal dna than the rest of the world and much of what we associate with modern humanity was probably dna that came from sharing dna with the homo sapiens sapiens or with the homo sapiens from africa right so like that taller slimmer build probably africa less body hair probably africa more body hair squatter forehead more prominent brow um all of that that's straight up neanderthal blood also that like stocky build you're welcome homo neanderthalus just fyi um, but the real issue here is not so much that there was the mixing of the three different races, but don't forget to add in the ladies, right? Now, um, I do want to point out, here's another place where we can see that artist renderings get a little dodgy. What we know about Homo sapiens at this point, this human evolution 60,000 years ago, uh, is that most of Homo sapiens uh, has most of homo sapiens have descended from africa and they do have a darker skin tone they may not be as dark as edelta but they certainly would be lighter than this lady here so this is a really good artist reconstruction based on the skull however it has clearly depicted this woman as though she were white um so and that includes things that we cannot know from the skull shape like her skin tone her eye color and the shape of her nose and even the amount uh the the amount of collagen in her skin or her lips so several features that belong in the parts of human appearance that would decay are all subject to interpretation right so this this homo sapiens woman looks very white but she actually was not likely to have had these white features and in particular to have had this kind of hair because that was much more characteristic of homo neanderthalus up here in europe so maybe this woman is actually kind of our hybrid human in here maybe she's a better representation of that um however <laughs> this which i really like um, this is a recent scientific rendering of a hyper-realistic projection of what a Neanderthal woman might have looked like. You'll notice that most of these reconstructions are kind of projecting a certain amount of backwardness or primitivity onto these skeletons, right? The skeletons that they're using to reproduce. Uh, some of them look more identifiable with modern humans than others. But this is the same kind of reproduction that can be produced from this same skull. And th our knowledge of this woman's DNA and her hair color and her hair texture. Um, we don't know about her eye color, but this, this is a, a pretty educated guess. And this actually looks like a real life person that you could encounter. So... Sometimes when we reconstruct the past, we are, we overdo its foreignness to the present, if that makes some sense. And this rendering of this Neanderthal woman does not look so distinctly different from modern Homo sapiens sapiens that you would see this person in public and be like, oh, you're obviously a lesser evolved human, right? So we want to be really careful what our differentiations between these various early hominins uh, mean, especially in terms of how human are they and what, what to do with our knowledge of their descendants. The key picture here, or the key point of, that we get from this picture, is that human, be human beings spontaneously evolved independently of one another in different varieties in different locations on the planet um, but they were all similar enough that they could intermarry um, which is like the nice way of putting it uh, so 
As a result, the DNA of most modern humans has shows some mix of many of these different types of early humans. The more European you are, the more Neanderthal blood you'll have. Um, the more East Asian you are, the more you might be related to Homo erectus. Those regional differentiations are true, but they're not going to be visible in anyone's flesh. And I want to make sure that that's quite clear. So the question is, this linear narrative of survival of the fittest, where each successive generation becomes more perfect than the last. Is that really fitting the evidence? Probably not, right? Not only did it, did everybody end up cross mingling and intermarrying and DNA just got mixed up all around like it's in a blender, uh, but even the path to get there was not nearly so linear or simple, right? And that's important because this has ideological ramifications for how we think about humanity, right? The fantasy of evolutionary perfection leads to an idea that it's possible to achieve some sort of human ideal, right? If you believe that each successive generation gets you closer to perfection, then the end game there, the, the logical telos or ending is that you can not only achieve human perfection, but you can speed it up. And yes, that is a literal Nazi po poster about eugenics, right? And pointing out that a hereditarily ill person costs money to the state, right? <clears throat> and that the, the hereditarily fit human pictured in the middle is bearing the burden of these hereditarily inferior human beings. So if that horrifies you, it probably should. That's literal Nazi propaganda, propaganda, propaganda. Um, but it wasn't limited to Nazi Germany. In fact, in the U.S., <laughs> The same ideas were espoused, not just in support for Hip Hitler, but actually eugenics as a practice is homegrown here in the United States and the Nazis got it from us. So the idea of a linear evolution toward perfection leads to the practice of eugenics, right? And it's particular that it's particularly important that we understand that it is not what the science says right as far as what we can tell from the actual evidence but the science at the time was definitely complicit in promoting eugenics as a legitimate form of knowledge and therefore a legitimate thing to be used in policy right so we want to make sure that we're aware that even the production of scientific knowledge under the best circumstances cannot be separated from the cultural values and the interpretations and the questions that people ask in the practice of producing that science, right? Uh, so let's just have a look at this. Eugenics in the U.S. was popular in the 1920s in particular. Uh, some of its features were things like IQ testing. That's where that comes from. And that was developed to determine who was fit and who was unfit. Um, and that means fit to breed, right? And so we'll get to that in, in another slide, but I just wanna make sure that we understand what fit and unfit refer to. It led to super bizarre things like better baby contests. So it wasn't just a beauty contest for babies. It was like, which of these babies displays the most evolved human genetics? Good times, good times. And then there was a fitter families program. And that was literally funded by the government and it pushed middle-class white women to consider breeding good white babies, I guess, um, to be a part of their patriotic duty. Like that's a part of their duty to the country is to produce um, high quality humans, I guess, is how you could say that. Um, and I want to make sure we're clear, this is not a fringe thing. This is like institutionalized in the center of American society. So the Carnegie Institution, the Rockefeller Foundations, the federal government had a eugenics record office established in 1911. The American Breeders Association is, yes, about breeding humans. 
breeding humans. Let's be clear. Um, even, you know, liberal heroic in institution Planned Parenthood, its founder, Margaret Sanger, the whole reason that she advocated for family planning is specifically because she was a eugenicist. Uh, good times and eugenics laws that allowed people to be discriminated against according to determinations of their fitness or unfitness, those were upheld, upheld by the Supreme Court. So for, for a few generations. Um, one of the big factors of a eugenics program is, is in America in particular, let's be clear, is preventing the birth of unfit people. Right. In Nazi Germany, they took that to another degree when they're like, uh, we're not just going to prevent the, the birth. We're going to like kill off uh, people that we deem to be unfit. But in America, one of their primary mechanisms was compulsory sterilization. So patients of men state mental institutions were often sterilized against their will and without their consent, and sometimes without their knowledge. This also applied to people with disabilities. They were deemed to be unfit and that they would be passing on genetic uh, inferiority if they were allowed to reproduce. So let's talk about some disability rights activism in here. Um, African-American women and womb bearers, so people bearing wombs who were like at various stages. So in slavery, um, women were used specifically to breed more slaves. They were also uh, the father of modern gynecology, literally did gynecological experimentation on enslaved black women without anesthesia because there was a scientifically supported belief that black women, black people did not feel pain the same way white ones did. And so it was fine. It was fine. We're going to just do numerous gynecological surgeries on this person without anesthesia. Um, in addition to gynecological experimentation, uh, the whole population was targeted for coerced sterilization after the end of slavery. So while they are enslaved, yes, let's make sure that they can reproduce but on our terms and our being white slave owners, right? And then when they, when they manage to get to emancipation, that table is turned around and they, are, they suffer coerced sterilization in order to prevent that population from becoming larger than and therefore more democratically powerful than the white population. Even modern cancer research has to thank this compulsory sterilization and experimentation on black women because HeLa cells, which are the cells that are the core of cancer studies, come from Henrietta Lacks, who was operated on without her consent. So long history of that with African-American women and womb bearers. But it's not limited to them either. Latinx womb bearers had to deal with this. Uh, throughout the 20th century, let's be clear, all the way up until 1979, a third of Puerto Rican womb bearers were sterilized. A third, a third, what? Um, but even in the 60s, California, that bastion of liberal ideals, right? Uh, had the highest state population that was sterilized and they were mostly Mexican or Mexican American or Chicanx women and womb bearers. But <laughs> uh, by far the worst, the worst demographic, or sorry, the demographic that bore the hardest burden of compulsory sterilization is indigenous women. So in the 1970s, which is not very long ago, that's in the last quarter of the 20th century, 40% of Native women were subjected to forced or coerced sterilization, and largely because they rely exclusively on the Indian Health Service, which is provided by the federal government. So it's the only program that provides health care to individuals who live on reservations, and 40% of the women who went through that health care system were sterilized against their will. So eugenics, alive and well started here in the United States, and then took off in Nazi Germany. Um, so just a couple of reminders that this is 
our history. And we want to be careful what we do with what we learn about human history and human evolution, right? And in particular, because when we look at the scientific evidence and we're not trying to find evidence for our belief that one type of human being is superior to another, what we actually find is that the outcome of evolution is adaptation and diversity, right? There are more types of life. There are more forms of human beings. There are more variations as evolution goes on, because that is what allows for survival. You have to have many adaptations in the world at once for any of them to prove adaptive to its individuals, right? So evolution actually doesn't narrow things down in a nice linear fashion. It opens things up in a very complex web of interconnected relationships. That is where we will stop part one.